one and a half times the stand. Being able to manage the spin of the ship in a way that would keep people alive and well, but also firmly rooted to the ground, was a critical skill for a pilot of Habitat-style ships. And apparently, today was her day to prove that she could master that skill under the watchful eyes of Nalzan. She quickly familiarized herself with the system, eager to impress. And as soon as the Dew was sure that she had grasped her duty completely, Sheeta was left to her own devices. Excited, she started her first shift as supervisor of gravity itself. And it was boring. The GS-32 was enormous and had an equally enormous crew. Meaning that where usually the pilot of a smaller ship would have to keep track and manage multiple systems, here there were a multitude of pilots, each keeping their own system running. And, with the gravitational spin being highly dependent on many other systems, her only job was really just to make sure nobody messed up so bad that it affected the spin of the ship. But, if she was honest, she could not even imagine a way for anyone to speed up the spin on accident. Additionally, additionally, the computer was programmed to process and correct each change automatically. So watching it was, in all honesty, not much more than a formality. That at least explained why they let a trainee pilot do it unsupervised, she'd have thought. Quickly, she had begun the same loop that her crewmate had been stuck in before her, just checking if everything was in order, over and over again. And while most species would most likely appreciate an easy position being granted to them for an entire shift, to the mind of a death worlder, designed to be in attention and look out for threats at all times. It was dull. And so her mind began to wander. And of course, all she could really think about was the day she had had. And now that she really had time to think and knew, she was not about to lose her livelihood to a dumb mistake. Embarrassment started creeping in. She thought back to the incident. When she had heard someone approaching her, she really was not paying attention thinking it was just some crew member going to reprimand her for dosing in the halls, as if it was anyone's business how she would spend her free time. Most crew members were by now used to her enough so that they could talk to her normally and even got comfortable enough to openly antagonize her. However, that did not mean that they would willingly physically approach her. Their desire not to be touched by her was usually pretty strong. That is why she really did not expect someone to reach for her shoulder while waking her up. Seriously? Who would wake up a predator by touching them? She thought someone had a sudden, unhealthy expand in ego. So she wanted to reprimand them. Opening her eyes, she did not expect to find herself looking back at a pair of dark, piercing eyes, staring her down. She blushed at the thought. She had reacted like a frightened kitten, not like a ranking officer. When had she gotten so frightful even in the heat of the moment? Once she realized what she had done, she fled. She remembered the look of the man, his dark eyes gazing out of his pale face, looking back at her confused as she was ready to fight. But he was not. Even though she had already injured him, he was standing straight, leaving himself wide open. It wasn't a fighting stance, but he was also not cowering in fear, like so many prey species would have done in his situation. He had just stood there, holding her gaze no problem, his arm a bloody mess. And yet, she could have sworn the concern in his eyes was not directed at himself. She began to wonder what kind of man the person named James really was. Had he been in shock? Had he just not realized the situation he was in? Did he have a death wish? According to the captain, he was a death worlder. 
just like her. But what death worlder would not immediately strike back or flee after such a provocation? Any Mayat would have either ran as fast as they could, seeing as they would probably not win a fight while injured, or tried ripping her throat out for daring to attack them. Maybe his people were just so hardy that he did not even consider her a threat. It certainly did not seem that way from the blood he had been losing. Also, while certainly not looking weak, he had not seemed to be any more physically capable than a Maya. So, what was it she was dealing with? At least if he was this nonchalant about being attacked, apologizing to him should not be too difficult. At least she hoped that. But how would she go about it? Just walk up and say it. Would that seem insincere? She didn't want to seem like she just did it, because she was ordered to. She started pulling her hair a bit as she continued to make up, and then dismissed scenarios in her head, mulling it over for hours on end. Every now and then, Nalzam would come to check on her work. Apparently unhappy about Sheeta's lacking enthusiasm about staring at a screen for hours. Of course, she didn't actually find anything amiss, seeing as the computer really did all of the work here. Time became seemingly viscous, every second dragging on. Yet, when a chirping sound behind her ripped her out of her thoughts, she felt like only a few hours had passed, not a double shift lasting an entire uniform day. Morning, the Raxious she recognized from the previous day said, Looking much better now. How was your shift? Sheeta, who had started to slouch a bit over the hours of standing and staring at a monitor, stood up straight and stretched herself, the bones and joints in her shoulders crackling and popping. Making eye contact with the raptor, she quietly replied, Nothing to report. The Raxious snorted knowingly, and dismissed her for the day, nodding. Sheeta quickly left her post, and made her way back around the room, towards the captain's seat. Officer Shida. Ah. The loud voice of the captain suddenly rang out from behind her, as she was heading towards the gate, stopping her in her tracks. Turning around and stiffening, she replied, Sir, I'll hide him. She flinched a bit, screwing up her eyes as she realized her voice had cracked from surprise. Utan had turned his seat around to face her, his massive frame looming above her. Leaning his head down, he smiled and said quietly, with his dark voice, It is cabin number 120. He gave her a knowing look, and twitched one side of his mouth, which was his people's way of winking at someone. Cheeta sighed in relief, and signed him okay, as her body relaxed, before turning back around and quickly marching out of the gate. At his time, the corridors and halls were still pretty much empty, most crew members either sleeping or at work, as lead shift had just started a while ago. So she was not bothered as she traversed the ship towards the cabins, quickly reaching the number 120. And indeed, the name tag next to the door identified the current occupant as a James Aldwin. Would he be awake? Was it really a good idea to wake him up in order to apologize to him? That didn't seem right to her. Nobody liked waking up, so it wasn't the best way to get on somebody's good side. On the other hand, she did have direct orders from the captain and she could not imagine somebody almost not caring about having their arms sliced open, also getting mad about being woken up. On the other hand, she could not imagine the first part of that statement at all. So what did she know, really? Deciding that she should best just get it over with, she stepped up to the door determinedly. She was just going to knock and request entrance. But something was off. When she went to knock at the door, 
she noticed that there was no point because it was still sealed, apparently, since the day the room was designated to a new occupant. It had not been opened a single time. Its bioscanner still waiting for its owner to arrive and unseal the cabin and officially start their life on board. Cheetah stood there, dumbfounded, her hand raised for a knock and frozen in midair. Why wasn't he here? More importantly, why hadn't he been here at all? More than an entire day. For some species, that was more than one complete sleep cycle. And it was definitely more than anyone could work at a time after losing that much blood. Especially considering he had to be fresh out of isolation, considering the sealed room, and thusly had probably not really slept before starting his work. What was the meaning of this? Horrific scenarios about the wound being more serious than everyone thought, and him breaking down somewhere on the ship played before her in her eye. She had to find him. But where to look? She had to think. She took off down the corridor, almost flying along in the low gravity, not really knowing where to go, feeling like she had to get there fast. Then she started thinking hard. What did she know about? He was a death worlder, and apparently he was new around the ship. Not very helpful. But he did stand out from the crowd, so she could probably ask around for him. And if he had not yet been to his cabin, that meant he was still wearing that torn uniform, so people would have been even more likely to have noticed him. Suddenly, she stopped dead in her tracks, standing up straight, punching her temple hard. His uniform. Why hadn't she thought of that? He was a researcher. And if he had indeed collapsed anywhere on board, and it was not yet reported to the captain, it couldn't have been anywhere with people around. So it had to have been either in his cabin, which she had already ruled out, or in his laboratory. Making a quick turn, she started heading towards the research area. Thankfully, it was close by from the cabins. She started pondering how she should find his laboratory among the sea of research facilities. But her thoughts were interrupted when suddenly her path was blocked by a big wall of fur, skin, and feathers. Cursing, she pressed her feet into the ground as hard as she could, tipping over forward from her momentum and skittering to a hold on all fours, stopping just short of crashing into the group of researchers, apparently also on their way towards Yuri, their workplace. The whole group recoiled from her, looking shocked at the small person crouching on the ground in front of them and making concerned noises. Huffing from the exertion, Sheeta pushed herself back to her feet, already looking for the best way to pass the group of people seemingly frozen in fear and blocking the entire hallway. Annoyed, she yelled out, Move it! I don't have time for your gawking. That seemed to at least kick them into motion, hurrying out of her way. Most of them, that is. And what exactly is so important that you think you can talk to us like that, Sheeta? An old Raphaelite woman with thick, dark fur answered, blocking Shida's way with her massive frame. Was she being serious right now? Her tail sticking up and waving agitatedly. Sheeta snarled, that is petty officer, Sheeta to you, and I do not recall having to justify myself to you. Her opponent was clearly unsure of her actions, her eyes displaying the fear Sheeta knew from other prey species, but she did not waver. With a certainty Sheeta did not expect drowning out the fear in her voice. The woman answered, I believe you have plenty to justify. You may be an officer, but you certainly do not behave adequately for such a position. You would think they would teach even death worlders to put their lowly instincts aside before allowing them on to the crew of such a ship. 
I was there when you had your outburst yesterday, and while James may be understanding as a death warder himself, I think officers should be held to a higher standard than their nature. Sheeta, who had been slowly getting less and less patient with the damn fool wasting precious seconds, suddenly raised up her ears, her anger evaporating. Wait, did you say James? She blurted out, indignantly interrupting the Raphaelite's ongoing lecture. Having been disrupted in her train of thought, the massive creature stopped, staring at Sheeta. Excuse me? The woman asked perplexed. You just said something about James. Do you know him? Sheeta asked excitedly. Why, yes, the woman answered, immediately getting interrupted again by an increasingly impatient Sheeta. When have you last seen him? Do you know where he is? She followed up, stepping closer to the large woman with each word, causing her to awkwardly step back. What? Nearly. What? The woman stammered, seemingly having lost a good bit of that impressive confidence. No, I do not. Not right now, but I would believe he is probably in his cabin. No, he isn't. She'd have cut her off. I've already checked there, and it is completely untouched. This wasn't helping, and she felt like she was running out of time. She took a deep breath and much more calmly explained, Look, I believe something may have happened to him. Do you know where his laboratory is? The Raphaelite's eyes widened. Something happened? She asked softly. Cheetah was already losing her composure again. Do you or do you not? She snapped at the woman who replied, Yes, I do. Just yesterday him and I were. Can you lead me there? Cheetah butted in then adding a bit softer, please. That seemed to take not only the woman, but also her colleagues, all gawking at the two of them. By surprise. Taking a moment to regain her own composure, the woman straightened back up and cleared her throat. Before answering, Of course, just follow me, you others. Go on ahead without me. But she turned and began quickly. Well, for her it was quick, making her way down the corridor in front of them. Sheeta followed behind her, hurrying her along. Visions of the possibly endangered man still playing in her mind. What is this about anyway? You said... Something about something having happened to James. The woman asked, taking large strides. Sheeta quickly explained her suspicion trying to quell the agitation in her voice. That does sound strange, the giant agreed, sounding thoughtful, and looking back over her shoulder at Sheeta. But why were you searching for him to begin with? Embarrassed, Sheeta avoided her gaze. That's none of your business, she squealed, letting her ears hang down and flinching at how pathetic she sounded. The woman made an annoyed sound at that. Well, we are almost there, she stated matter-of-factly, raising one of her big clawed arms to point towards one of the laboratory gates, standing wide open. Sheeta sped up, sprinting past her guide, and reaching the door in mere moments, steadying herself for anything that might await her in that room. She took the sharp turn, bursting into the room, and sliding across the floor before coming to a hold, panting from exhaustion. And her eyes widened. James stood, bend over some sort of device that she could not identify, his eyes firmly pressed against some sort of tube protruding from the apparatus. Next to him lay a notebook, 
on which he scribbled something without looking. So he had, in fact, not collapsed. First, relief washed over Shida. Then, annoyance. So, she had worried like that for no reason at all. Great. Apparently, her overreacting was becoming a theme. She sighed audibly, but James appeared to be too engrossed in his work to notice her. He scratched the back of his head with his free hand, unknowingly showing off his removed sleeve and still healing wounds to her, reminding her that, as annoyed as she felt at the moment, him being all right was indeed a good thing. Behind her, the Raphaelite had caught up with her and stepped into the room as well. Oh, thank goodness. You are okay, she said loudly, breathing heavily and nervously fiddling with some of the hair on her neck. James perked up, surprisedly, and spun around to look at them. He looked even more tired than the Raxus had last night. Dark bags had formed on the pale skin under his eyes. His jet black hair, that looked a lot smoother than that of a Mayat, was disheveled and stood up in some places. Additionally, he looked just about as sweaty as Sheeta felt right now. Having not cleaned herself yesterday, worked an entire double shift, and just ran around the complete ship. Dark stains of moisture had accumulated around his armpits, and she could smell him from where she stood. Then again, she could smell herself, too. So she was in no position to complain. Oh, hello, you two, James greeted, rubbing his eyes. Then he opened his mouth widely into a big yawn, covering his mouth with his hand. This had very different effects on the two women. Sheeta, having calmed down, was now reminded of her own tiredness, yawning as well. The Raphaelite, on the other hand, recoiled a bit at the sight of their bared teeth. Even if James tried to cover them, did you want anything? James asked, again massaging his eyes, before stopping for a moment and adding, Wait, what time is it? His personal assistant laid, discarded a few paces away from him on the countertop, so he could not look at the time himself. This was also the moment Sheeta embarrassedly realized she could probably have called him over the communicator, or even the computer to find out whether or not he was okay, which had somehow completely escaped her in her panic. About the sixth hour, the Raphaelite replied, looking at her own device on her wrist. Have you been working this entire time since we last talked? It has been more than a day. How are you still standing? How long had he been working for? Not on my planet, James replied. I am used to days, more than twice as long as uniform days. He let that statement sit for a few moments. Then, scratching his neck awkwardly, he added, But working twelve hours is a bit excessive, I guess. Then he shifted his gaze onto Sheeta and stepped towards her, extending his right hand forward. I am James, by the way. I didn't really get a chance to introduce myself before. He said, baring his teeth at her, causing her hair to stand up. So he was mad at her, after all. But his eyes were closed, and his body slack. What was he doing? She took a step back, slowly shifting her weight into a position in which she could better react should he attack. He reopened his eyes and looked at her very confused, his mouth closing again. James... The piercing voice of the woman to her right suddenly rang out harshly, causing Sheeta and James alike to flinch. You were doing it again. James looked over to her, seemingly still just as confused for a moment. Then he pulled his hand back to loudly smack his forehead before covering his face with it. Sorry, sorry, you're right. He mumbled, his voice muffled by his hand. Thank you, more. Guess I really am tired. 
Sheeta looked over to the woman, apparently named Moore, in an asking manner. Moore shook her big head. Do not worry about him. That just now was not a display of aggressiveness. For some forsaken reason, his people have apparently evolved to bare their teeth in delight, giving everybody they interact with a heart attack in the process. She explained exasperated. Sorry about that, James chimed in, having lowered his hand but still looking embarrassed. I usually know not to do it. But with me being tired and you looking so human-like, I just kind of forgot. Sheeta nodded and relaxed her posture. It's all right, she replied, and tried to replicate the gesture by lifting her lips. No harm done. Chewie was not quite sure if she did it right. But it at least did seem to amuse him. He extended his hand once more, this time keeping his mouth shut while smiling. When she just stared at his hand for a while, he shook his head and shut his eyes tight. Great job, James. Really showing yourself at your best, he mumbled to himself before opening his eyes again and scratching the hair on his face with his free hand. Then he explained, Hmm. Back on Earth, we usually shake hands when we introduce ourselves. It's okay if you don't want to. I just kind of did it out of habit. Sheeta extended her own hand, gripping his. She was not sure how strong she should grip, so she just tried to match the pressure his hand was putting on hers. Well, I did not exactly put my best foot forward either, I would say. Sheeta professed, letting her ears hang a bit and averting his gaze for a moment. Then she gritted her teeth and finally looked him into the eyes, loudly saying, My name is Sheeta. It is a pleasure to meet you. The pleasure is all mine, James answered. Then he let go of her and took a step back, looking the two women over. If I may ask, what did bring you two here, by the way? He inquired. For a moment, they did not answer. Sheeta, who had had an entire day to agonize over how she would apologize, tried to quickly pick the best of all of her ideas she had dismissed before. Well... I was just on my way to work when Sheeta ran into me, searching for you, and demanded that I lead her here, because she could not find you and claimed something might have happened to you. More summarized quickly, then adding, she did not. Tell me why. James, who had listened to her carefully, turned his head toward Sheeta, his look wordlessly asking, You were looking for me. Well, I got worried. Sheeta answered flustered, holding her arm. When I went to your cabin and realized you had not even been there yet, I thought maybe you were in danger. After all, you are hurt. Her tail wriggled agitatedly while she talked. Oh, I guess that's understandable. Sorry to have worried you, James said sheepishly, before asking puzzledly. But... Why were you trying to find me in the first place? Sheeta looked to her feet and bit her tongue while trying to overcome her pride. James seemed to notice her struggle. Calmly he proposed, More, I think we have kept you from your work for long enough now. You just go on ahead and do not worry about us. I will just clean up here and then go to bed. In the meantime... Sheeta can explain what it is that she had to discuss with me. Maybe she will even lend me a hand, who knows? He looked at the giant reassuringly, smiling lightly and crossing his arms. Moore did not seem thrilled about the proposition, apparently being curious about Sheeta's reasoning as well. But, perhaps not wanting to seem too intrusive, she nodded her head up and down her fur coat rustling softly and obliged. Success to you, she said while seeing herself out. Success to you, James and Sheeta echoed simultaneously, although Sheeta was a bit 
hesitant. She did not often use that phrase, and was even more rarely told it. After that, the giant figure of Moore disappeared out of the gate, closing it behind her with a loud hissing sound coming from the machinery. For a moment, Sheeta and James looked after her at the door. Then James turned back to Sheeta, putting his hands in the pockets of his uniform and smiling at her before asking, So what is it that you needed to see me for? But Sheeta walked past him, towards the place where he had worked when she had arrived. He looked after her confusedly, raising his eyebrows. You said you need to clean up, right? Tell me how I can help, Sheeta ordered, leaning backwards onto the counter. This chapter will continue in the comments section as you wa. A Job for a Death Worlder Chapter 4, Chapter 4 The big gate looked just like the one that had been closing off his laboratory. Pneumatics, bioscanner and all, staying well in the theme of everything designed as a community effort having no creativity put into it. Too tired to care. James let his hand slump down onto the pink mass, waiting for the two clicks to sound out. With its typical loud sound, the door unsealed and opened, allowing him entrance into his new cabin. He was awestruck for a moment. The room was big. He knew it was going to be big, but still, standing in it, it was way weirder than just kind of knowing it. The furniture, which had been filled with his belongings, barely even took up a fourth of the room leaving lots and lots of empty space. And most of it was even bigger than the stuff he used to have back on Earth. The bed, for example, was at least king-sized, if not bigger. Additionally, the ceiling was very, very high, leaving him feeling very small as he looked up to the bright fluorescent lights above. It made sense, seeing as all the cabins were the same size and he was not even half as big as some other crew members. But it still felt like a waste. On Earth, he had always lined his furniture up along the walls, leaving a tiny bit of room in the middle. Here the huge bed stood against the middle of the wall opposite to the gate. Next to it stood what was not really a nightstand. Because it was more of a slightly undersized table, to his right, part of the cabin was cut off in order to form a sort of bathroom. He opened it up, entering and ditching his clothes on the way in. He was sweaty from a day of working in the warm air. At first he stilled his thirst that had been building up for a while without him noticing at the sink. After he had quenched it, it was time to shower. He had to watch out for his wounds while washing himself off, being careful not to get any water on the fresh stitches. In addition to the cupboard light sanitary unit and a sink, the bathroom contained a mirror hanging over a small counter, and gladly a toilet imported directly from Earth. Additionally, a small cabinet containing things he needed for personal hygiene took up a third of the rightmost wall. Once he felt sufficiently rinsed off and not wanting to subject his injuries to the heat of the drying function of his sanitary unit, he stepped over towards it, pulling out his hair dryer. And he felt mighty silly when he realized that he definitely could not plug the Type C electrical plug into the ship's outlets. He shook his head, laughing, before wrapping himself in a towel and leaving the bathroom. Most of his possessions that he had taken with him were most likely stored in the big closet standing in front of the left wall. He got to work, rummaging through the different doors and drawers, making note where everything...